Hello, good afternoon from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. My name is Alexandra Kuzmanovic and I'm happy to host this second weekly uh, Ask WHO on COVID-19 with Dr. Maria Van Kerkove, our lead expert on COVID-19 and our executive director for emergencies, Dr. Mike Ryan. Um, this will be a short session like last week, um, but please ask your questions on Twitter using the hashtag AskWHO. If you're watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, or YouTube, leave your comments, ask your questions via comment section. Um, Maria and Mike, thank you for making time in this uh, busy uh, year to <laughs> respond yeah. questions from our viewers watching us across different social media channels. Um, before we receive some questions, would you give an, a bit of an uh, overview? We are six months into pandemic. More and more people are getting infected in almost all parts of the world. How can we turn this around? Dr. Mike or Maria? Start? Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I can start. Well, <clears throat> you're right, and it's been a, it's been a long journey uh, for everybody, um, for communities, for governments for, for WHO but it's been it's been a huge strain on, on so many communities on those who've lost loved ones on health workers who fought in the front line and, and of all of the, those who've had their lives disrupted and we do uh, want to find a path back to something we recognize as normality but that's uh, that's still a journey ahead um, and the current situation with you know, we're approaching nearly 15 million cases around the world. Uh, over 600,000 people have died, and that's probably an underestimate. So this virus has clearly shown us just how dangerous it can be. But we've also, while seeing that and seeing that disease spread and cause so much uh, devastation, we've also seen communities and countries fight back, and we've seen them achieve success, and we've seen them sustain that success uh, by using very simple measures. And what we've seen is when communities are united, when governments are clear about how they go about things uh, and when we all work together we can beat this virus and we can suppress it, we can reduce deaths uh, and uh, now with the prospect potentially of having effective vaccines down the line we also have the hope of another measure but that's still a while away so I think we have to really focus on where we are now in the pandemic and what we can do together now and I think the toughest part of this is sustaining our effort at community level it's really hard after seven months. Everyone's tired, everyone's exhausted, everyone just wants things to go back to the way they were. Who wouldn't? We too. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, in the face of a crisis, the virus is choosing too much of our future right now. Uh, and we need to choose our future. And the only way we do that is we fight the virus. Mike, uh, you mentioned only if we are united at community level, we can fight the virus back. And we're already receiving questions what can we do on a community level as individuals to fight the virus back? I know you explained this repeatedly in our press conferences and in other appearances, but I think it's worth re repeating once again. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think everyone really needs to understand that they have a role to play in this, whether it's at the individual level, it's at the family level, it's at the community level, it's at the state level or province level, um, at the national level and at the international level. Um, no one is safe until we're all safe. And so there are a number of things that people can do. And I think, as Mike has said, that you know, we do hope that there will be a vaccine, a safe and effective vaccine that comes down the line. There are many things, there are many tools that we have right now that people can use. Um, and this includes the basics, the basic measures of ensuring that you clean your hands regularly um, and make sure that you practice this respiratory etiquette, uh, making sure you keep a physical distance from people. And again, I just wanna highlight that we're saying physical distance physical distancing and not social distancing because we need people to feel connected with others. There's an, a tremendous uh, impact on our, on our mental health, not just our physical health. So we need people to, to stay connected with their loved ones as best as they can. Um, it includes wearing a mask when being asked to wear a mask. It includes staying home if you're asked. Um, it includes you know, seeking medical care and calling those hotlines that are put in place, um, doing your part. And I think that uh, national governments you know, have put out recommendations and it's very important that people follow those recommendations. Um, and I think lastly, most importantly, is keep yourself informed. This situation is changing and it's evolving um, constantly. Um, and we need to make sure that we follow the information, especially about where this virus is 
because that will help us determine the types of decisions that we make on a daily basis um, to minimize our own risk of getting infected and perhaps passing it on to a loved one. Thank you, Maria. Question came in as well, again, why are we not wearing the mask? So maybe we can also clarify when people should wear masks to protect as a part of all the other um, actions you just mentioned. So yes, so so masks are, are one of the tools that can be can be used in, in the prevention of of, uh, of transmission between people. Um, so WHO we advise the use of masks, particularly when you're caring for patients. So especially in health facilities, um, when you know that somebody is infected with this virus. For the general community, we recommend the use of a mask if you're sick yourself, and actually if you are sick, you should be at home and you should call your medical provider. Um, but also in situations where you cannot do physical distancing and if the virus is present in the community. So in indoor settings, you know, when you cannot do physical distancing, we recommend the use of a fabric mask. So we are sitting apart here, so we, that's the reason why we are not wearing masks in, in this setting. Mm -hmm. um, we are receiving a lot of questions, Mike, maybe you can take this one, about uh, children, sh should people uh, keep children uh, at home or they should go back to school? And also, are there any particular precautionary measures to be taken for children? Um, I'll let uh, Maria will add to this because uh, She's the, she's the real expert around here. Uh, the, uh, I, I would say that school is a microcosm of our society, of our community. School is a subset of people from our community. So if we have uh, spread of the virus in our community and that spread is intense and it's widespread, then that disease will spread through the school environment. So we know that children can spread the disease. Thankfully, uh, very, the vast majority of children don't suffer a very severe illness, but that doesn't mean that they can't participate in the process of transmission. Uh, we see this with many diseases. We see this with, uh, for example, for, with polio. Uh, many, many children can process the virus, pass the virus on, never get sick themselves. But when that virus reaches a particularly vulnerable child, then that virus could cause paralysis. So it's pretty much the same with, with COVID. The, the disease may pass, through children, it may find the child then that's less immune or has some uh, compromise and could cause a more severe infection, uh, or it can also be brought home to uh, vulnerable grandparents or others. So uh, the way I would see it is that when you have intense transmission at the community level, then we have to be careful about schools. Um, but also we have to also recognize that education is hugely important. Mm. And there are environments uh, in the world where being at school is a safer place to be. Uh, given the social conditions and given other, there are many schools that act as very important points of nutrition for children, mm. they're points of safety for children in, in areas that are not necessarily as safe socially for kids. So schools don't just function as sites of education. They're very important centers within our societies and within our communities. So we have to do everything possible to bring our children back to school. And the most effective thing we can do is to stop the disease in the community. Because if we control the disease in the community, mm -hmm. we can open the schools. Mm -hmm. So we need to focus again back on controlling the disease at the community level. And younger people have a huge part to play in this. This is not, uh, and, I, uh, and I hope we're, we're speaking to, to many uh, younger people and younger adults out there. Uh, and I'm so proud of younger generation the way They've taken on uh, the issue of racism. They've taken on the issue of climate. Uh, we need a young generation that's willing to take action. Take action for a better future. Take action. Take control of our society. Take control of our future. And part of that is ensuring we get through this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we need a better future. We need a stable future. We need a new normal. And it's not about being victims of that. It's about taking action to ensure that we beat this virus. And younger people, why they may suffer the least effects of this virus, participate in transmission. And we need particularly younger people and younger adults to really take on that responsibility and not in a sense feel that they're giving something up uh, that's precious to them. And I know they are because uh, we were all young once <laughs> and the freedom of youth and the, 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 the desire and the right you have to go and enjoy life and go and experience life. And it is hard to put your life on hold, especially uh, when your adult life is potentially just before you. So I think I would love to see the same energy and the same commitment and the same activism that I can see going into other aspects of our future really commit themselves 
to getting rid of this disease. Uh, and, I, and I think we need to see more young leaders. We need to see leadership from youth, leadership from young adults. It's your future. Uh, it's your planet. It's your society. Uh, you decide how it is. You decide how it will be. Not old fogies like me. Can I just add to that? Please, say please that Maria. I, th I think also the, the creativity that we see with the younger generation, um, you know, help us find solutions. Help mm -hmm. find the solutions Absolutely. that we need to go forward. This idea of a new normal, I don't think anyone completely knows what that looks like. We need to create this ourselves and mm -hmm. everyone has a role to play. It shouldn't be older folks that, like us, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that, uh, that decide, you know, I think, I think we need everybody to play an active role in that, and that, um, you know, people and of all ages need to feel empowered that they have a role to play in this. So speak up, speak out, you know, help us work through this and, find, and, and really find that way to be creative and innovative. Um, that this, this is temporary. I mean, this idea of having to put some things on hold is hard, and I understand that because we are also putting, all of us are putting things on hold, but it is temporary. We will get through this. You know, we will get through this. There is hope. You were asking about the six months and can, pe can people turn this around? Can we turn this around? We can absolutely turn this around. And I think everybody f needs to know that, and, and we're not just saying that because we are optimists here. We have seen many, many countries do this. It's gonna take tremendous hard work but it needs to take every single member. I have two young kids um, and, you know, just trying to get them to wash their hands regularly, you know, and, and, and do the, the showers every night and all of that. And I know my son is watching, mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone has a role to play. And, I, and I, I really, I think you've heard us say this many, many times before. We want people to feel empowered and to be part of this solution and to be part of the response. Thank you both. This was very motivational and inspirational. And I can tell you that we are already receiving some questions from people watching us on TikTok. Um, Sukanya is asking how to protect myself and others from COVID if I need to take public transportation every day. So this is one of the settings that mm -hmm. young people are yeah. using on daily basis to commute, mm -hmm. go school, mm -hmm. still see their friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. what do they need to know? I can start because I take the bus every day, right? So I'm a user of public transport, uh, which is uh, sometimes uh, a surprise to people, but uh, I take the bus every day. And it, it, it really is about simple behaviors. Uh, sometimes I let a bus pass by, a bus is, looks too full. If it doesn't feel safe, it's not safe. Okay, I'm going to be 10 minutes later than I would normally be. It's the same thing if I asked someone, many of the people watching this, ride their bikes in urban areas. You take a big risk doing that every day. But you know the basic rules. You know when you can go a bit faster, a bit slower. You know when you need to stop. And sometimes cyclists know how to jump the odd red light yeah, and <laughs> wear helmets or whatever. Yeah. So it's the same when it comes to the bus. It really is about, it is about the intensity and the duration of the contact you will have with other people. If you're going to be on public transport for a long time and going to be very close to people, that's more risky than being on public transport for a short time and been well spaced with people. So the number of people or the density of people in the environment and the period of time you spend in it is the risk. Then you can reduce that risk by not getting on that bus or if you do get on that bus finding the area of the bus that's least crowded. It might be furthest from the door. Uh, uh, it's about simple techniques. Uh, you know, if you, sometimes, you know, the buses, you have to press the button to open the door when you get on the bus. Well, your finger has just touched something. Uh, sometimes you use your elbow to do that. Unfortunately, some of the buses here in Geneva don't react to an elbow. <laughs> they only react to the touch of a, of a finger. Um, and uh, maybe that's the, what I often do when I get on the bus is I think, okay, I'm going to end up touching a lot of things. So I touch that and I get on and, you know, get sit down. And then as soon as I sit down on the bus, I have my mask on me, but then I take out hand sanitizer before I touch anything else, before I go near my iPhone or try to stick my headphones in, I just clean my hands. And then I know my hands are clean. I can touch my phone. Mm. So it's a simple kind of routine, a kind of technique. It's like maybe uh, like, well, uh, uh, if you were going through any routine or thing you do, uh, in life. So I think building a routine for how you go about the business of getting on the bus, washing your hands, you know, picking that least, uh, the least uh, crowded part of the bus, uh, I think they're the simple things. And uh, I've been on public transport for, okay. for months the whole time through this. And uh, again, I've let buses pass by when they've been too full and, and, and try to manage my risk that way. Uh, because I'm still committed to public transport as a way of getting around. It doesn't, for me, 
uh, it doesn't give me the excuse to hop in my car because I live in the city and therefore I don't want to have a car and maybe it would be safer for me now to have a car but then I have an impact on the environment so I have to trade off the good and the bad and I try to manage that risk in a way that minimizes the risk to me but maximizes my chance of my commitment to climate or my commitment to something else. And I think most people are, we do that every day. I think, to be honest with you, this is something humans, we're designed for this. Adapt. We do adapt. it, we yeah. adapt, we live Change. in complex environments and we make complex decisions every day. Uh, the issue is just to learn and absorb the behaviors you need to keep you safe. Uh, and it's all out there. I mean, in fact, if anything, we're, we're overloaded with information about what to do and what not to do. And sometimes I feel people feel overwhelmed by all the advice they're getting. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something on our side we need to be careful with. I know a number of people have said to me, my God, if I did everything everyone told me to do, I'd probably hide under my bed all day long. That's the only way to be safe. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable thing. I think we have to be very careful uh, to create enough concern in people so people react but not so much concern that we drive fear and we drive uh, panic and finding that balance is not easy. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we have another question and comment actually uh, from uh, our viewer on Facebook, Jennifer Randall, who says that you're doing a great job. Thank you, Jennifer. And she's asking, how can we engage people who are not wearing masks? Should it be mandatory or should we try to convince? That's a really, really good question, <laughs> Jennifer. Um, you know, the use of any of these, um, any of this advice or the use of masks, um, forcing that to happen sometimes doesn't work. Um, but, you know, these uh, advice, this advice, these guidelines are put in place for a reason. So it's really important to understand why um, the advice is put out there. You know, there must be a reason why there's an advice to use a mask in a certain situation. So, for example, using a mask when you go into a shop or using a mask when you're on public transportation. These are situations where you can't do physical distancing. Um, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is um, if you put on a mask, it's, it's to protect you from infecting somebody else. And if somebody else is infected from them infecting people that are around them. And so really understanding why those, those um, that advice is put in place, I think can be helpful. And if you don't understand, ask why. You know, find out what is the reason for this. Um, why are these, um, items being told to us um, and then see what it is, you know, okay, maybe it's, it's inconvenient, maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable. I have to say putting on a mask is, is not the most comfortable, but it's something that you can do. Again, this is temporary, um, you know, this is something that you play your part in um, and if that can help pre prevent transmission, then please, please do that. Thank you, Maria. Can I just maybe please. add to that because I, I think it's a key point. Because we see this in other parts of our lives. I mean, social norms and what we do is part of the norms of our society. What we expect of ourselves and our community expects of us uh, is it, always a mixture of your acceptance to do that. In other words, I think that's a smart thing to do. I will do it, which is my acceptance of that behavior. And then there's also the deterrence of someone says you can't do that and there'll be a punishment if you do do that. Yeah. We do this all the time. Seat belts in yeah. cars, baby seats in cars. Uh, drink driving rules. There's an element of social, I mean, if I get in a car with my three-year-old or my four-year-old kid and I stick them on the back seat and don't put a seatbelt on, I'm breaking the law. But I'm also breaking a social norm. Mm -hmm. uh, because other people will look at me and go, oh my God, you're mm -hmm. doing that? Mm -hmm. Or if I go into a bar and I drink, you know, five or six drinks and then I go and get in my car and I drive, that's not socially acceptable anymore. There was a time when that behavior was socially acceptable, it was totally normal. Yeah. It's not acceptable anymore. And the way we got there was a mixture of deterrence, rules that said you can't do this, but also a change in the way our attitude to that. And I think both are important, but I would much prefer the, the role of uh, acceptance and trust rather than the role of enforcement. Because right. enforcement does not, it does, behavior that changes because of acceptance can sustain itself for a long time. Behavior that changes because of enforcement is not, it's not, the same. It's not sustainable yeah, because you yeah. keep having to apply the enforcement. So it, it, it's much better if it's through trust and if it's through acceptance that we change any of our behaviors because it's a more sustainable way for us to change. But we have to also accept that in certain situations, 
uh, enforcement uh, may be needed. Um, and uh, But again, when a rule is enforced, it can be enforced in a number of different ways. It can be enforced through people pointing out to people that you're doing something that's not acceptable and it can be done through warnings, it can be done through trying to convince people and I've seen uh, a number of authorities doing that where they don't have punishments for people but they point out to people that you're, you're doing something that's not allowed. Yeah. So I think you can build that up but uh, we have to be very very careful in all of this to remember that human rights are important in the centre of this. We are members of a community and a society but we're also individuals mm -hmm. and we're free to express our individual views and we're free to carry out our individual behaviors as long as those behaviors don't impact on the well-being of, of others. others and i think that's the contract we have in society so we need to not look at what is my right to behave you have a right as an individual to behave in any way in a sense uh, you wish to as long as your behavior does not impact on, on, on essential issues in somebody else's life. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves all the time. Am I impacting others? Uh, if I'm not impacting others, fine. Yeah. There's a lot of questions coming from our viewers and we thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to pass another one from a viewer from TikTok again. Um, is there a risk being in large gathering outdoors? So that's a good question. Um, the risk depends on the context that we're that we've mentioned. So um, indoors is riskier than outdoor. First of all, what's risky is where the virus is. So we need a good understanding of where this virus is, and so that's why there are systems in place to be able to detect cases and define cases, make sure that they are isolated. Anybody who is infected is isolated from other people, and that we carry out what is called contact tracing, which is essentially finding every contact, close contact that you have, an infected person has, and, and separating them, putting them in quarantine from someone else. This is what we call breaks chains of transmission. Um, so that's first and foremost, and that's important for somebody to know when they're taking a decision about, do I do this activity or do I do that activity? As it relates to outdoors, doing things that are outdoors um, means that you have more space, uh, means that there's you know free flowing air and there's better ventilation um, and it means that you could be more physically distanced than others compared to something indoors. One of the things we want to highlight is avoiding crowded indoor spaces. I think that's really important right now, especially in this part of the pandemic where we are, um, to avoid, avoid those types of situations if you can, that's good. So outdoor spaces are, are even better. But even when you're outdoors, you still need to be physically distanced from individuals. So that's at least one meter apart. Um, and make sure that you practice your cleaning your hands, make sure that you use your respiratory etiquette. Um, and if, you're af if you cannot do that, outdoor, even outdoors, make sure that you wear a fabric mask. Thank you, Maria. Um, here is another question coming from TikTok. How can young people transmit COVID-19 since they don't suffer the disease or no having sy symptoms? You want to start? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, usually, uh, the disease or the virus is processed in the nasal cavities or the upper respiratory tract. So what happens is the virus enters, it lands on your, on your the mucosa inside your, your nasal tract, and the virus can replicate in that situation. And actually, you can create quite a bit of virus up there. Um, and uh, what is known is that the peak in those viral loads, even if you're not sick, the peak in those viral loads usually occurs around the day you get symptoms or even before mm -hmm. you develop symptoms. So you have a lot of virus, uh, even though you don't necessarily feel well. And in fact, even people who get quite sick later very often have their highest load of virus in their system before they feel very unwell. Right. So therefore, uh, it is possible for people who feel well to have quite a bit of virus uh, in their nose. Um, and if you then are in their airways, if you then cough or if you're very close to someone or you sneeze or even if you speak very loudly or shout or if you start if singing or in gyms where there's a lot of exertion, anything that produces higher pressure air coming out of your voice box tends to project droplets. Uh, we've seen that. I mean, we've all been in nightclubs where you can't hear the person sits standing beside you. The music is very loud and you end up you know, three inches away from their face, shouting at them, and you're going, what? And then the person is shouting, you know, or you're singing along with the music. And in those environments, what's happening is that, you know, otherwise healthy people who may be getting sick in a day or two, or may already be starting to feel slightly unwell, can project a lot of droplets from their nasal, from their mouth or from their nose. And that's how people who are otherwise well 
can can transmit the the disease and in, in in but there are other modes of transmission but that's the main yeah. way i think i think it's important to for younger people to understand and even kids like even though younger people and kids tend to have more mild disease they don't feel unwell or they just feel a little bit unwell they can still pass the virus to others but it isn't universal so even young people can get very very ill and we have seen young people in hospital, we have seen young people in ICU on ventilators, and we've seen young people die. So I think it's important, even though we luckily we do see the majority of young people and children having mild disease, they can get sick and mm -hmm. they can die. And so we need everyone to understand that they're not invincible. And that's not meant to scare anybody, but we do need a little bit of re reality, you know, so people understand that, that they can get sick. But what is even more important, that even though you're younger, you may not be part of a vulnerable group. You may live with someone who's more vulnerable. You may live with somebody who has an underlying condition, who has chronic respiratory disease, who has cancer. You may live with somebody who's over the age of 60. And if you get infected, even though you don't feel unwell, and even though you may not even have symptoms, you can pass the virus to someone else that is vulnerable and they could get really, really sick, require hospitalization, and they could die. So it's not only about protecting yourself. We want everyone to do what they can to protect themselves, but it's also about your responsibility of protecting others. So again, it's just everything that you can do to prevent you know, yourself of getting in that nightclub situation, um, especially where there's active transmission in, in some countries, you know, avoid those crowded situations in close contact with one another to prevent the opportunity for the virus to pass. The virus likes people. The virus doesn't just waft around. It needs people to pass between. So if you give it, if we give it that opportunity, it will pass between people. And again, on that, even though people, younger people <coughs> certainly don't have the same mortality or death rate, uh, what's clearly becoming apparent is that uh, a good proportion of people who develop moderate illness have long-term yes. issues with yes. fatigue, yes. with uh, with uh, exercise tolerance, uh, with with lung function, and, and other things. And I mean, the essence here is that the, the virus causes the, the the air sacs in your mm -hmm. in your lung to become inflamed, um, but it also causes, uh, in in many cases, the blood vessels around those uh, air sacs to become inflamed and what you have is this really sort of inflammatory process that goes on in the air sacs and in, in, in those small blood vessels and when that subsides it takes a long time for your lungs to regain their normal function and sometimes for your cardiovascular system and that's why a lot of people are suffering long-term fatigue they're finding it really hard to go back to the gym they're exhausted if they're going up and down the stairs and these are young people yeah. now we hope and many of them are making slow recoveries but who wants to spend three months or six months or a year recovering from an illness that lasted 10 days that or 12 days that you can prevent? Yeah. Uh, we don't, I mean, we, we, we live in a society, we go to the gym, we're trying to stay fit, we're trying to make healthy choices. This is one healthy choice we can make. Yeah. Avoid getting COVID-19 yeah. because it's probably, even if you're not going to die from it, or even if you're not going to be admitted to hospital, a significant minority of people, even young people, find it hard to make a full and immediate recovery yeah. from the disease. Can I just say that many people have reached out to me personally mm -hmm. on Twitter and on other um, uh, social media means about groups that are in that recovery phase. I just want to say that we hear you. You know, we do hear you. We do have a group that's looking at the longer term recovery of people who have quote unquote recovered. You know, the people mm -hmm. that you're talking about that are dealing with these long term effects. We hear you. Um, and what we're trying to really understand is, I mean, even though we're seven months in, I know it feels like an eternity for most people. It's still very, very new, and there's still a lot that we're learning, but particularly those who have recovered but still have these lingering effects, we're trying to better understand what that means, and we're trying to better study this so that we can give you the support that you need. So I just wanted to give a shout out to the groups that have contacted me to say, we do hear you and we are listening. Thank you very much for receiving a lot of questions. So I'll try to summarize maybe two more. Um, one is coming from Facebook from Cecilia Vichis. How effective is contact tracing and how often should one get tested? You mentioned that we need to know where the virus is in community to control it. So I thought it's good to clarify contact tracing and testing. Yeah, so contact tracing is essential. In infectious diseases, 
what you what everyone needs to understand is that the virus passes between people and so when we know where the virus is you think of I wish I had a vis little visual right now think of these dots you know think of these dots representing people if someone has contact with lots of dots then you can spread the virus between people so what contact tracing does is it identifies a case and testing is essential to be able to determine who has the virus and who doesn't have the virus and then you find all of the people that they came in contact with two days before they develop symptoms up to 14 days after they develop mm -hmm. symptoms you find those contacts and then you follow them you put them in quarantine which means you separate them from others so that if they have the virus or develop the disease that they don't pass it to others um, and you follow them for 14 days um, if we do that for every case if we do that well um, for even most mm -hmm. cases we will be able to stop transmission between people. It's incredibly effective, but I have to say it's incredibly difficult. Um, but it is possible, and there are so many people now that are trained to do contact tracing. And one of the things I'm really encouraged by are many countries, high income, low income, um, north, south, east, west, rural, urban, that are building up this workforce of contact tracers, which are people who are what we call these shoe leather epidemiologists, you know, which basically means people on the ground who are helping to find all those contacts, support those contacts through the quarantine period, um, and, and making sure that we, we break these chains of transmission. Maybe you wanna? No, I think that's I, pretty good. Uh, on the testing thing, and sometimes we get a bit distracted by the whole testing, you know, number, number of people we test. It's not so much about the absolute number of people that are tested. It's really about who is tested. Uh, yeah. We really have to focus on testing suspected cases first. Just because you're having a test every three days when you're well doesn't necessarily uh, mean anything. Uh, what we really need to do is focus and prioritize testing for those who need testing. Uh, and that is people who are developing the illness or unwell or people who are contacts who develop a fever. The more important issue in this is how efficient is the testing process? Mm. Are we testing people quickly? Are we turning the results around quickly so it makes a difference? Little point having a test if I have the test today and I get the results in 10 days time, yeah. because by that point I'll have spread the disease to another group and they'll have spread it to somebody else. So it's about the speed and efficiency of testing and it's about the percentage positive. When we hear people talk about this, I much more look at, if we take my own, uh, my own uh, country, Ireland, uh, only quarter of 1% of people tested are positive as of yesterday. Uh, that means a very small proportion of people are testing positive, which means you're having to test many people to find a positive case, which means you're almost over-testing, but it means you're not missing anything. Mm. There are other places in which the testing positivity rate is 40%. Yeah. Somewhere like Afghanistan right now is 40%, which means 4 out of 10 people tested, 40 out of 100 tested are positive, which means we're missing lots and lots and lots of cases. So when you look critically at testing, don't just look at the number of people tested in your country by day. Look at how fast is the testing done? How quickly are the results available? What is the proportion of, and you have to be your own critics. You have to look at the system and you need to ask those questions uh, because testing is important, but it's only as important as it contributes to contact tracing. It contributes to our knowledge uh, the Director General, Dr. Tedros, has said it many times. Uh, you can't fight a virus blindfolded. And not having testing is like fighting a virus blindfolded. If you don't know where the enemy is, if you don't know uh, where, your, where your enemy lies, then you're going to be a victim of that. So I think that's the importance of testing, but testing within the context of yeah. surveillance. Can we just say to the viewers that there's two things that are really important that you know of what to do. If you're feeling unwell, even a little bit unwell, uh, stay home. Contact the hotline, contact your medical provider, and find out what are your next steps. Because it's important, even when you're feeling unwell, some of them may have underlying conditions, some may have other, contact your medical provider and find out what should I do? Should I get a test? Can I get a test? If you, might, if you think you are a contact of a known case, stay home. Again, contact the hotline, contact your medical provider, say, I think I'm a contact, what should I do? Find out more information. And I think people need to really understand that there's things that you can do yourself. The contact tracing system and the testing system and surveillance systems in place in countries are working. 
Um, some are working better than others. Um, they're not 100%. So you as an individual need to know that there are things that you can do as well. If you are concerned and you can stay home, stay home, contact that hotline, contact your medical provider, say, what do I do next? I think I may have been in contact with someone who is a case. If you are not contacted by the contact tracing system, just find out what you can do. Just be informed, be vigilant, be informed, you know, know where this virus is in your community. Thank you very much. We received a lot of questions from uh, parents of young children, how to protect their babies or if their kids go to kindergarten or to schools, should they wear masks? So if we can give some advice for parents of, of young children before we close. So I'm, a, I'm a, <laughs> so I'm a parent uh, of a, my husband and I, we have two kids. We have a nine year old and we have an 18 month old. So we, the way that we uh, keep our children safe is applying, ensuring that we teach them the basics in hygiene, making sure that there's hand washing or alcohol-based rub. Even the baby, we do an alcohol, we do the alcohol-based rub when we when we go out. Um, we actually keep our outings quite minimal. You know, if we need to go out, we go out. If we don't, we are very fortunate to have a, a nice home that we can stay in, we can play in, and we keep them home. Um, my son's school was open for a while, it was closed for a while, then it was open for a while. But again, when he went to school, make sure that he follows the rules at the school and keep the physical distancing and, and the, the rules that they have in place. Um, they wash their hands, I don't know how many times per day. He said, Mom, I think my hands, you know, I said, this is good. And, and again, it's about habit. It's about habit, habits forming. And especially with young kids, they're actually quite compliant. Babies, it's a, little, it's a little bit more difficult. But there are a lot of systems that are put in place in creches and in schools to protect children. But it's important to talk to your kids. I think one of the, the most important things that parents can do, and I know we're all doing our best with this, and I know it's really, really hard, and how much we really appreciate teachers and, and, you know, in, in, in teaching our children, but talk to your kids. This is really scary for many of them, um, and it's really confusing. Um, this is a virus that you can't see, you can't smell, you can't touch, and so it's very confusing for them. Talk to them, um, listen to their fears, uh, do the best you can at answering their questions. If you don't have the answers to those questions yourself as a parent, try to find out where you can get more information. I know my nine-year-old is incredibly clever and, and smart and asks probably the toughest questions I've received, and I don't know how many press conferences we have we have had, um, but really tough questions. And so I, I would just encourage you to try to, to talk with them. And if they're scared and if they're fearful, acknowledge that, you know, it's okay to be scared, but let's turn that into something positive. Um, my son drew uh, rainbows for, for everybody here. Mm. Turn Instead it in. Of mine. I have mine. <laughs> you have your <laughs> mine as well. So, you know, turn it into po something positive. And I know a lot of kids clap for health workers, and so they can be a part of this too. So, whatever we can do to kind of engage them and make sure that they feel part of this. But just to say, we do acknowledge that this is scary and we will get through this. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, for the end, do we have any? positive signs from science on vaccines and treatments. We received a lot of questions on this issue. Yes, we'll probably have to do a whole other session on that because there is that much uh, positive news. Uh, I, I think uh, increasingly we're seeing more vaccines move into what we call phase three trials, which are real world trials. That means when we give the vaccine to people in the community and we see if it protects them from the virus that's spreading in their communities. Those studies are just getting underway. What's positive I think is that of there's four or five of those for, uh, going through now, none have failed so far. So pretty much all of the vaccines that have in the platform that have come through phase one and two trials have all made the grade in terms of safety and in their in ability to generate immune response. So we're not seeing a lot because very often in vaccine development, you lose one or two along the way and you're hoping to keep a number of candidates right through to the end. So we're making good progress. We're not losing candidates right now. Uh, the real world trials, are very different and we really thank those people out there uh, particularly again it's mainly 18 to 55 year olds who are volunteering for the studies because they're, they're hugely important studies and the people are stepping forward and saying yes I want to be part of this study and that's a massive contribution to the whole world people who are doing that for drug trials they're doing that for vaccine studies it's a huge gift to humanity to participate in research you don't have to be a, an observer you can participate in this get involved and uh, uh, we're working with many partners now to expand the trials uh, around the world uh, and also to expand access to those vaccines there's a lot of work going on not only to ensure that we get an effective and safe vaccine 
but also we can scale up its production and there's a lot of work going on that and we can allocate and give vaccines to everyone in the world who needs them and that's a big fight is to make sure that we are fair because it's not just science is important mm. but fairness is just as important and we need to be fair about this uh, because this is a global good vaccines for this pandemic are not for the wealthy they're not for the poor they're for everybody uh, so WHO is a very important job to make sure that we're fair um, and we're working just as hard on that as we are on the vaccines. On the drug side as well, we're beginning, we've seen some positive results from uh, some drugs. Uh, we're adding more drugs into our, into our uh, solidarity trials. Um, there are some interesting and hopeful signs with things like uh, hyperimmune globulin and potentially down the line with, uh, with monoclonal antibodies, again, based on uh, material on blood that's taken from um, from recover patients so again patients in recovery are contributing and benefiting people who are coming behind them in the system so um, I think we are seeing uh, hopeful signs but I think we have to be realistic on two things uh, one we need to be realistic on time uh, realistically vaccines no matter how fast we push we have to make sure these vaccines are safe and that they're effective and that takes its own time and we're speeding that up as much as possible we're not in any way going to cut corners on safety we have to be able to look ourselves in the eyes and we have to be able to look at our communities and ensure them that we have taken every precaution to make sure these vaccines are safe and effective before we go uh, giving them to general populations in order to make that happen we can shorten that time but realistically, it's going to be the first part of next year before we start seeing people getting vaccinated. That's the first sort of uh, issue. Second issue is we've vaccines are never 100% effective. They, they, they generate immunity in most people. Uh, for some vaccines, it's only some people. For some vaccines, like measles, they're highly effective and 95% of people are protected. We don't know where we are with this. So we're going to have to wait and see how effective the vaccine is going to be and how long will the protection last. So the idea that we're going to have a vaccine in two or three months and then all of a sudden this virus is going to go away, I would love to be here saying that to you, but that's just not realistic. And it's really important that we're realistic in our expectations. We have to push, get the best vaccines we can, get the best treatments we can, but we also need to be realistic and we need to do what we can now. And Maria said it, there's so much we can do now. And it'll be so much easier to get rid of this virus using vaccine if we've, if we've already suppressed it. Because it's, it's, easier, it's easier to beat an opponent when you've already exhausted your opponent. And we need to exhaust this virus. We need to push the virus out of our communities. And then using vaccine will be much easier for us to be effective in the use of that vaccine. So we need to, we need to work as hard as we can now to continue the fight against the virus, work as hard as we can to develop the vaccines, and then bring the two together uh, to finish this thing off, I hope. I thank you very much. I thank all our viewers from all parts of the world. I'm not going to list the countries. It's a long list. <laughs> oh, um, I thank Mike and Maria, and please watch us next week. Uh, we'll inform you about the time. Thank you very much, and have a good day. And stay safe.